starting lineup. Leading off at right field, Leon Day. At center field, Oscar Charles. These athletes love the game of baseball so much that they were willing to endure whatever social adversity confronted them as they travel the highways and byways of our country just to play baseball. That passion would not only change the game, but it would change our country for the better. And that's the story that we lay out in its greater context. Judy Johnson, catching the greatest home run hitter of all time, Josh Gibson. But what I love about our museum is the fact that you don't have to be a baseball fan to appreciate it. If you are a fan of American history, you're gonna love this museum. Obviously, if you're a baseball fan, you're in hog heaven. You know, it combines the best of both worlds. Tell me about this chicken wire here. Chicken wire was symbolic. It, it is symbolic. See, during that era, if a black fan was allowed in to watch a major league game, this is how we were oftentimes separated. Black fans sat on one side of the chicken wire, white fans sat on the other side of the chicken wire. So in symbolic gesture, we used chicken wire to separate all of our visitors from the centerpiece of our exhibition. This story is not about the adversity. Yes, it's anchored in the ugliness of American segregation, a horrible chapter in this country's history. But out of segregation rose this wonderful story of triumph and conquest. Moses Fleetwood Walker. Moses Fleetwood Walker. Played during Reconstruction or shortly thereafter. Mm -hmm. Played for a Toledo team in 1883. He is clearly the only black man <laughs> on this team. Was well, you know, a known black. See, there mother may have been other very light-skinned blacks who had passed themselves off as white. With Moses Fleetwood Walker, we say known black because obviously his skin was of dark, dark shade. And uh, barehanded catcher. You know, and uh, it didn't last very long before guys like Cap Anson, outstanding baseball player in the National Baseball Hall of Fame, and others formed what we refer to as a gentleman's agreement. You know, basically there was no written doctrination banning blacks from playing on white teams. It was a verbalized agreement amongst players, managers, and owners that essentially said, if you allow a black to play with you, you can't play with us. Well, Anson was so good that it was easy for him to build a coalition of followers who shared that same sentiment. That would ultimately ban blacks from playing on white professional teams for the next six decades. Yeah, these men would go to Latin America and they were treated like heroes. Stayed in the finest hotels, ate in the finest restaurants, would come back home, of course be treated like second class citizens. So as a result, a lot of Negro League players would call Latin America home for one simple reason. In Latin America, they weren't black baseball players. They were just baseball players. White Cubans could play. You know, dark-skinned Hispanic players, mm -mm. they found sanctuary playing in the Negro Leagues. And, and so, you know, there's always been this close brotherhood between the Negro Leagues and Spanish-speaking baseball players because of that both cultural and historical connection. Oddly enough, it was the black press that pushed for a more formalized, structured baseball operation. Rube Foster would become the architect of that. He was brilliant. And he's the gentleman who started, he started the it. Negro Leagues. He started it. Yeah, yeah, this is Rube Foster. Uh, without question, the greatest baseball mind this game has ever seen that nobody knows anything about. He actually owned the Chicago American Giants, but he had booking rights of four, three. He had the Chicago American Giants and booking rights of three other teams of the first eight teams that, is, that formed the Negro Leagues, he essentially gave up the booking rights, kept the Chicago American Giants in a deal with the Negro Leagues, and was paid about 15% of the annual gate for doing so. He was also a very rich man. When Rube Foster started the Negro Leagues in 1920, over 400,000 black folks went to those games. You know, so this was a very thriving baseball enterprise. Black, two. black Americans actually loved baseball. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Why? Because it you know, as we look at it from the Negro League's perspective, here we had something that we took great pride in. It was inherently ours. We shared it with the rest of the world, but it was ours. And so we went to those games and we dressed up looking pretty. But you know, look at it. She going in, she got a mink on going to the game because there was nothing recreational about a Negro League's game. 
it was the social event of the week. And you know, oftentimes we were leaving church going to the game. So the old expression, dressed to the nines. We were leaving church going to that Sunday doubleheader, you know. And so these men were heroes. They were our heroes. We had our own heroes in this community, black stars, who again took a back seat to no one. When you start talking about the likes of Leroy Satchel Page and Josh Gibson and Cool Papa Bell and Boom June Wilson and Hilton Smith, these men were stars. This is the black owned hotel, you know, and scaled down the size. It was special because you could walk into the sitting room of the street hotel on any given day and you might see sitting in one of those chairs former heavyweight boxing champion Joe Lewis, or at that time the fastest man in the world, Jesse Owens. Although Jesse Owens would never race cool Papa Bell. That's a whole <laughs> other story. You know, but Lionel Hampton loved the monarchs. As a matter of fact, Buck would put Hampton in a monarch uniform. He'd sit on the bench and serve as an honorary coach. Uh -huh. Lena Horn, we got her picture throwing out the first pitch at an all-star game. Cab Calloway had his own semi-pro black baseball team. Such pride. Absolutely. Louis Armstrong had his own semi-pro black baseball team. So, you know, there's always been what I like to refer to as this, I, I don't know, mutual admiration between jazz and baseball. You look so young. You look like a kid. The, the biggest thing I, I can remember, the first thing is that I made the Kansas City Monarch. The second thing was uh, uh, Satchel Page giving me that nickname. That was one of the best highlights in my life. After I tried out, I went back. They wanted me to stay there, but I told them, no, I wasn't going to stay. I said, because if I don't go back and finish high school, my dad will kill me. <laughs> and so they let me go back, and I came back down the next year, the following summer. It was a good life, but yet it was a hard life. I can remember one time we went into one city. We were sitting out on the city limits because we had to, we'd come in at night, and the cops just kept going around, just following right around, just make sure that nothing was, we couldn't do, get out of that bus or anywhere. <clears throat> and so that next morning, when we got up, well, when we woke up, we heard all this noise. It was a band. And we wondered, what the heck is this? This was a band coming out there to get us and take us into town. But the reason why they came out here, a tornado went through that town the day before. <laughs> went right straight through the white neighborhood. The black people were hanging up clothes and the sun was shining. And that changed that town. When people walk into this museum, you know, again, I think they think that they may be experiencing a very sad, somber story because, again, it's connected to American segregation. But it's a celebration. It's a celebration of the power of the human spirit to persevere and prevail. The belief in self, you know, refusing to accept the notion that you're unfit to do anything. So I'll show you. You know, they knew they could play. They were world-class athletes. Some would even argue that they may have been better athletically than their counterparts. You know, so they knew they could play, but everybody else didn't think they could play. Certainly they, they were stronger mentally. Absolutely, you had to be. To endure and overcome the things that they had to just to play baseball in this country. We're talking about sometimes, Vicki, going into a town, filling up the ballpark in that town, but not being able to get a meal from the same fans who had just cheered you. Like people say, oh, it's so nice up north. It was just as bad up north as it was in the south. They knew how to smooth it over up north better than they did in the south. We played white ball clubs way before they integrated us. And <clears throat> we would barnstorm with them and everything. I mean, with the House of David, they put on a show for before the game or after the game or in between innings or somewhere and doing between the innings, and they play us. This is the, this That's is the, the House, House of, of David. David. 
uh, and they do play a great role. They were all white semi-pro team based out of Benton Harbor, Michigan, who used baseball to spread their gospel, but they do play a great role in black baseball because they would barnstorm all over the country playing with and against Negro League teams. And of course, they were mimicking David from the Bible. That's why they grew their hair so long and many with the long whiskers. Um, one of my favorite stories associated with the House of David, 1934, the Denver Post Tournament becomes the first organized baseball tournament to integrate the House of David with recruit Satchel Page to pitch for them. Now, Satchel wanted to look like his white teammates, dressed in a fake wig and a fake red beard, and would strike out 51 hitters in three games, and the House of David would win the $7,500 prize money for winning the tournament. These men were going against the grain. Oh, of course. Absolutely. Based on their Christian values. Yes, yeah, yeah. Because it's hard for a Christian <laughs> to be racist, in theory. Yeah, it, 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 the two Christianity and having these obscure views about color don't go together because we're all God's creatures. And I remember we played uh, the All-Stars in uh, uh, Western League All-Stars. That was after they had called Ernie Banks up. And er I took Ernie Banks' place at shortstop and he was up at Des Moines, Iowa, I think it was. And that's where we played the All-Star game and I was on Satchel Page's All-Star team. And we went to the ballpark. Of course, we drove in on a bus. Satchel Page came in by plane. Now, you think it's a kid. I'm kidding, but that's the truth. And when he got there, he got there about 15 minutes before game time. And we said, well, where you been? He says, ah, I, the plane was late. He went down and changed clothes, walked down to the bullpen and threw three pitches three and says I'm ready and he went out and pitched no hit no run ball for six innings then he set everybody down that was all of us except the catcher he struck out the side in the seventh inning and waved at the crowd that's how good that man, that man was so good it was a shame he, he knew what he could do I have never heard, I never saw another ball player like him in my life. We became adamant about the style of play that became signature Negro Leagues baseball. Very fast, very aggressive, very daring. So they would bunt their way on first base, still second, still third. If you weren't too smart, they still home. But the thing that was so interesting is that was the style of play that drew both black and white fans who sat side by side during an era when doing something socially together was virtually unheard of. Negro Leafs baseball brought the two races together. I was a uh, 16 year old, 16 years old when I went to Kansas City for a tryout. That was the year that Branch Rickey came and got Jackie Robinson. And so he plays here in 1945. And at the end of the 45 season, signed his contract to play with Brooklyn would spend the 46th season in, in, in their farm system in Montreal. And then, of course, on April 15, 1947, make that monumental walk on the field as a member of the Brooklyn Dodgers, forever changing the game of baseball, but more importantly, forever changing this country. And how so? Because that spawned what we believe to be the modern-day civil rights movement in this country. You think about that. That's 1947. That's well before those more noted civil rights occurrences. So for all intensive purposes, this is what started the ball of social progress rolling in our country, baseball. And our country literally jumped on the coattail of baseball. So even though baseball had been vilified for not allowing blacks to play, when it opens its door, <laughs> our country follows suit. Well, it broke up the Negro League in uh, about, let's see, he, they, they got him in 46. He got called up to the majors in 47. And... Mm, 56, there was no more uh, Negro League. The barbershop has always been a staple in black life and one of the few black owned businesses that survived losing the Negro Leagues. Because if there is a bittersweet aspect to the overall story, it lies in the fact that you can directly parallel the rise and fall of the Negro Leagues 
with the rise and fall of black economy in this country. And to a large extent, black economy never recovered from losing the Negro Leagues. I would do it all over again for the guys that, uh, to, uh, th that, that has benefited from it, you know, been, you know. I find a lot of enjoyment in getting all these former players back together, like a lot of these guys that we bring down to our annual reunion haven't seen each other in 50, 60, 70 years sometimes. So I think that's really cool. I like to do that. And then I'm also working on, um, I work on this pension program that allows players that played over four years to get $10,000 a year in pension money. So that's something that, you know, I find really important to help a lot of these players that didn't make any money back in the day. You know, a lot of people lament about the money that the current major leaguers make. None of the Negro Leaguers ever lament that. You know, they, they get it. You know, they knew that they created an opportunity that allowed them to make this money. This is a capitalistic society. They're not going to pay you more than they can afford to pay you. You go ahead and earn it. See, the most money I ever made in baseball was $850 a month. But that was back in 1946, 47, 48. You see, and that was a lot of money. In this book, People ask me for autographs, and I usually didn't save them. I just tear up the letter, autograph, and tear up the letter and send it back. But I want to show you one from uh, Japan. Here it is. I got a letter from Japan asking for an autograph. <laughs> see that? You see it? That's from Japan. I've been speaking to these Negro League players since I was about 12. I'm 19 now, and I've, sp I've probably spoken or met over 300 players, but, you know, many of them, you know, were just brief conversations or brief meetings, you know. When I first started getting in touch with these players, a lot of them would start reaching out to me for information. It went from me asking them for autographs, and they would ask me, you know, have, do you have any photos or any newspaper articles? Um, or have you spoke with any of my former teammates? So I began, you know, this process of trying to give them some stuff back and using the information they would give me and old newspaper articles, I started trying to figure out like how old their teammates were, where they were born, and narrow it down to see if they were still alive. So I would use like places like whitepages.com and some more advanced websites and I started tracking these people down, calling up, you know, numbers. A lot of them were wrong numbers and stuff, but I ended up, track, I've tracked down over 100 ball players now. What people don't really understand, I guess, is the Negro Leagues during their heyday where their ba the quality of baseball was just as strong as, you know, Major League Baseball. These guys were just as good, you know, talent-wise. So it's, it's kind of a part of history that, you know, in many aspects is just kind of left behind and, you know, not touched upon. But in baseball history, as well as, like, you know, race and stuff like that, it's really important, I think. Um, because what these people dealt with on the field and off the field just relates to America at that time. It's the museum that nobody gave any shot to succeed. When we started this project in 1990, Vicki, we were in a little one room office space inside the historic Lincoln building across the street from where we are now. The office space is about as big as this area that you and I are sitting in, had a conference room table and former Negro Leaguers who were living here, like the late great John Buck O'Neill and others, literally took turns paying the rent to keep the little office open. Some of our key contributors, you know, they supported us, but they kind of looked with, you know, with one eye kind of like, I don't know about this. But to his credit, the late great Buck O'Neill stood steadfast in his belief that this was the place for a Negro Leagues museum to be. This is where the history began.